Good evening, Ngiriwe. Um, today, Yujochi family is commemorating the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. We join hands with Rwandans and friends of Rwanda to remember the loss of the um, country first in 28 years ago. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome everyone in this commemoration. Uh, allow me to share with you the agenda of today. Um, we will start with our welcome remarks by our, v our VC. After, we'll have one minute of silence for remembrance. After, we will have the candlelight as a high sign of hope. We will have uh, the talk by Bishop Richahana. After the talk, we'll have a Q&A to um, have a time for people to ask questions about the genocide against the Tutsi. And we will close with remarks by the mayor who will be joining us shortly. Thank you. Um, VC, you're welcome. Thank you to welcome us all on the campus, uh, Collins. Uh, Your Grace, Bishop, John, dear staff from academic admin and finance, and most important, dear students, I insist most important because you have seen that we have worked for you before starting. Because all this, it's about today and tomorrow. And tomorrow, the world is yours. What we do, what we are going to think and discuss about is for today. And it is for the young generation to assure that this never happen again. So today we are gathered for the remembrance of the innocent victim of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. This genocide that claimed over one million people in this country. We mourn the victims whose life were tragically cut short during these killings and atrocities that occur during 100 days. 100 days. And this is why, since every year, we are remembering during 100 days. We have invited His Grace, Bishop John, who will give us a talk that will be followed by a discussion to help all of us to reflect on the consequences of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, but not only on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, to reflect on all genocides. Because it happened even today. So we stand and we say never again. And it happened again and again. And this is an occasion to reflect about that. Because we are an institution that educates for social justice and that promotes equity. And we must understand, and I know that your teachers insist on that the role of leadership. And leadership is not always the head of state. Huh? We all have a leadership here. We all have a leadership in our home. We, we have a leadership that educates our brothers and sisters by talking and discussing, that educates our friends. Some of you have Russian friends, isn't it? Some of you have Ukrainian friends, isn't it? Sudanese, Chadian, and other places where people are killed. 
And we all know that the extreme exclusion lead to genocide. Whatever place it's done, whatever people are excluded, whatever color of their skins, whatever is the amount of money they have in their bank account. So, we are far from reaching the objective of never again as a human family, as global leaders, fighters, and practitioners, it is our duty to help the global fight against genocide. The global fight against genocide denial. The global fight against genocide ideology. It is our duty as global health fighters that stand for social justice. And during the genocide, Rwanda truly witnessed a lot of devastation, including many Tutsis killed, injured, wounded, traumatized, orphaned, widowed. There was also destruction of infrastructure, destruction of a country. At that time, remember, the health sector was destroyed like all sectors. The rate of under five mortality was very high. Maternal mortality was very high. And since then, this country has made amazing progress. We have now the best vaccinated kids on us. However, we still have $800 per capita. And how we do, yesterday I was in discussion with an university in Italy, and they asked, how do we do that in Rwanda? You have only $800 per capita, and you have managed COVID better than we did. And this is because of the journey this country has taken since 1994, fighting genocides, fighting genocide denial, fighting genocide ideology. <coughs> Not <coughs> in words, in facts. I remember one day, when His Excellency say, if you continue to kill there, I send my boy, my boys. It was not in Rwanda. But he say, people killed our people. The world watch it without moving. I will not let it do done on my watch. Fighting genocide is according what we have. Me, I have no boys to send somewhere. I have my advocacy possibilities. I have my writing possibilities. I have my discussion possibilities. Everybody have to do that with what it has. So the country is very different than 20 years ago. And um, there is still a long way to go for improvement, for progress. And we need to understand something. Why every day you wake up, you have to think about the vulnerable, that's what we teach you. But the vulnerable are those who risk their life, and among them, those who risk their life for what, who they are. Because the rest, you, you can change, but you can never change who you are. So I hope that the discussion today will be vivid. I hope that you take the opportunity of the great soul we have invited for leading this discussion, because we have a lot on our plate. 
it continues and it continues. And we have something that we need to remember. There is no better amnesic species than the human species. And if we stop remembering, we open the door for this to happen again. So, together we remember, we unite, and we commit. And I hope that in your heart, you take the commitment to fight genocide, to fight genocide ideology, and to fight genocide denial and promote the primordial human right that is the right to live. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Avisi. Uh, now I would like to humbly request everyone to stand and take a minute of remembrance for the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before you take your seats, uh, we're going to have uh, to, to light the the light of hope, and we will have first to um, have the light from the mayor, and then we'll have the, the light to everyone, and after that light, we stand for a minute again before we sit.
everyone um, you can have a seat also for the sake of safety please make sure you sit with the lights either with the candles either you turn them off or you make sure you hand it uh, safely at this moment uh, before I welcome our guest speaker I would also like to welcome Honorable Mayor to be with us today uh, so before we start for us to make sure that everyone we're able to engage and understand the conversation. I'd like to request students from MBBS who speaks both English and Kinyarwanda to mingle with our contractors so they can be able to translate for them. So you're sitting, you can move, and also they can move. Na na vuga ga ku kujira ngo twese tuze gukurikira ikiganiro neza abantu ba contractor batumva icyongereza twivange n'abanyeshuri kugira ngo baze kubasemurira. So when you show me my mom, I look at my sister and her hair. I know now when I'm with my mother, I'm going to do something stupid. I'm going to do Before we start uh, our talk, I'd like to share with you a short biography of our bishop and guest speaker. Uh, bishop Ujahana has a Master's of Arts in Religion, got from Trinity Episcopal School of Ministry in Arbridge, Pennsylvania. He is one of Rwanda's most effective leaders, evangelist, spiritual, and social enterprise. He has contributed to the infrastructure development in Ishira Diocese, founding of prime, prominent schools, hospital, and health centers. He was the chairman of National Units and Reconciliation Commission from 2010 to October 2021. His tireless work is in finding peace, forgiveness, reconciliation, and other initiatives on reconciliation in denominational churches and community development. He is the president of Prison Fellowship Rwanda from 1997. In 2011, Bishop John and Harriet Richahana started a new ministry called Transformation Ministry. Continue his efforts of reaching the poor in the community and children in school, elimination of poverty by means of education, integration, and productivity. He is the author of The Bishop of Rwanda, published by Thomas Nelson, publisher 
publishers on Rwanda history. And the Jesus of Hope, the Jesus Hope of Nation, published January 2015 by Zach Media. He also had an awards. He received awards from Climate of Excellence in Leadership and that of William Weberforce Award in 2009. Allow me to welcome Bishop for this discussion. Thank you. Please uh, give me the grace to, to do without protocols at this very moment, the, um, at this 28th memorial commemoration. But I can't fail to recognize the, the grace of uh, this school's leader Professor Agnes Benaguaha, and uh, the presence of the mayor and uh, other members. Thus, I asked for the permission and the grace not to go into protocols so that we may concentrate on this memorial. It's 28 years since the, the RPA, RPF, engaged their efforts, their conviction, their commitment to make a difference. First, to stop the genocide which was consuming the lives of their own, our own. The sons and the daughters of this nation, not only consuming the human lives, but also consuming our dignity as beings, as a human being, and consuming the sense of our humanity. And they lost lives in order to save lives, but they committed to make a difference. Today, we commemorate the death of over a million people who perished only in 100 days by the hands of the youths of this nation, by the hands of the educated people of this, this nation, by the hands of the people of the mothers and fathers of this nation, and it had to be stopped by the federal Rwandese with the mega resources, but with huge, huge vision and commitment. So we, are, we celebrate, we celebrate in such a manner, we celebrate, we remember, and we commit to remember Five times I've been in Israel to join the Jews, the Jewish community commemorating, agonizing, remembering their beloved ones who perished into the Holocaust. I've been in Sudan. And I've taken the trouble to go into different places to have a comparative study on the reasons why we should continue to remember. The remembrance commits us, the remembrance commits us to study and to draw lessons from our history, painful as it is, cherish that history and draw the energy, draw the commitment, draw the courage, draw the resilience to be able to make our future better. And I'm happy 
and I thank you, Professor, that you emphasized the importance of these youths to be here because this is for them more than it is for me. I don't have much opportunity to use this knowledge as much as they do. So the, 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 the genocide ideology that led Rwanda to the genocide, this ideology has been brought in the country for a purpose. And the purpose is to divide Rwanda, exploit Rwanda, exploit the energy and the brains of the Rwandese. That was the purpose. But the results of being manipulated and distorted in mind and otherwise resulted into policies that led to the genocide. Those of you who have not taken, have, have not had much opportunity and the chances to study the history, Rwandese had an opportunity, an excellent opportunity compared to other African countries. The, Rwand the Rwandan community had one language we still have that same language. We have, they had one culture. We still have that culture. And they had one religion at that time we call traditional religion. We study in the comparative study of religion, which is no longer the case now. We have uh, Christians, we have Muslims. But even then, we got divided the way we did. What were, class, what were classes in this community were converted into tribes. So when, when we talk about the, the, the manipulation of colonial powers, I think I remember the last time I was here, I remember I slightly mentioned about the resolutions of Berlin in 1885, when they celebrated, they signed, and engaged those resolutions to divide what they called the third world. Those of you who speak French, the tiers monde. And the method applied in Rwanda to divide us into the Hutu, Tua, Tutsi as tribes, which were classes. Those of you who have had the opportunity to study the culture, the former king of Rwanda, the Rudahigwa Mutara, used to call himself Umutu wa Musinga. Means, means the servant of Musinga, who was his father because he had given him the inheritance that he was proud of. So the relationship of Rwanda what they called the classes, which is today, if, if, if I asked one of these professors of one of these, uh, if I ask the mayor, honorable mayor, do you have anybody serving you at home? Of Tumukoze Murugo? Numwe? You have two. So now the mayor has two Bahutu in her house. You know, economically, one has to employ somebody. And these classes are in the UK today, are in America, are all over these countries of the world. Classes are there. But those colonial powers failed to have much distinction in Rwanda, and they used classes as tribes, and they had to justify it. So they called the Tutsis from they said they had their source in, in, in Ethiopia, and the Hutus were from Chad and from Malawi, and they all came, but some came earlier than the others. Therefore, they divided in, into those, and it worked. It became the policies of the country. 
Therefore, the destruction of the Rwandan family, the Rwandan culture, the Rwandan pride, a nation which was never been invaded but which was expanding, was meant to, to expand, was ruled first and foremost by the Germans. The, the first colonial power in Rwanda were Germans who came from Tanzania in our neighbor, in our, from our neighbors, and they, uh, they occupied Rwanda in 1990. Then they were taken over by Belgians in 1916, when the Germans, of course, got defeated in the, world, in the First World War, and uh, the Belgians took them over, and they came, but came with, uh, with anger because Rwanda had fought uh, alongside their masters who were Germans and had inflicted pain on, on, the, on the Belgian infantry, which were Congolese. At that time, their colony, the, the, by the way, their colony, but their victims as well. So they had that anger and they divided Rwanda the way you know. If you see the former Rwanda, the geography of the former Rwanda, the Horo Masisi was Rwanda, the Horo Ruchuro was Rwanda, the Horo Bishusha was Rwanda, neighboring the, the borders of Uganda. Part of our neighbors here in Kabare were part of Rwanda up to Rwentobo, those of you who have been in Uganda. Now Rwanda was squeezed to what it is today, and that was not enough. They also divided us into the Hutu Twa tribes, which were artificial and fabricated. And we swallowed it wholesome and we accepted we were tribes of the Hutu Twatuti. So dividing, dividing the, the dividing Rwanda into that format and the teachers into schools, seminaries, and um, teacher training colleges. Every, everybody, wa, wa, ev almost everybody went to school had to go through that. Inculcating the false knowledge about who we are and we took it. So that resulted into what we are commemorating today. And people say that uh, the Batutsi were oppressing the Bahutu, which is not the case. There was an economic, Rwanda was so powerful as far as the judgment of the, of the, of the, of the colonials, Rwanda had its form of high level form of administration and the governance. Rwanda had an organized economic format and uh, exploitation of resources. Rwanda had a sense of security. Rwanda had its security and established security. And also Rwanda had its political relations relating to their neighbors. And if cases were required, Rwanda defended its territory. That's why Rwanda did not lose its people to slavery. But I want you to know we, we, we should have developed a sense of Pan-African attitude and Pan-African study. This division, this infliction of, of exploitation did not take place in Rwanda only. See what happened in Congo. Congo lost 10 million people during the governance of Leopold II. Congo has all the resources it needs to develop. But I don't want to talk about Congo and the, the condition of Congo today. My concern is our condition today. We commemorate the genocide against Tutsi. But how, how did this develop? It is not to strike like thunder. It was prepared. Persecution from 1959, Rwanda lost hundreds of people, thousands of people, starting from the south of Rwanda. It continued in 73, when Habyarimana took over from Kaibanda, had a coup d'etat, and uh, 
promised Rwanda that he's going to bring peace, it continued. They continued to kill the Tutsis. They, they discriminated them from schools. They discriminated them from work. They didn't allow them in the army. They, they did all the sorts of discrimination against the Tutsis. But it culminated into the genocide. But I want you to consider this. Think of a human being, a human, an educated, a university graduate who thinks that his wife or her husband, the Tutsi, is a snake and a cockroach to the extent that a husband kills his dear wife or, or, or lets go of her husband because he or she calls the partner a snake. Imagine your dear husband. You've had children with that person. You've lived together. You have loved one another. And you believe you let go of her, that emotional relationship, that humanity, that sense of being. You let her go, or you yourself kill her because you think, get conviction, she's a snake. I want you to imagine you are, some of you are medical students, others are leaders, others are, you know, you are, you are calibers. If somebody reduces you, reduces you to that level in your brains, in your understanding, in your humanity, you, you, you get the conviction your wife is a snake. Then you kill her or you let her die. And the children who resemble you are snakes and those who resemble their mother are, are not snakes. From one mother, I've uh, been in your assimilator room and uh, you, are not, you see the science, the human science, and you think that a, a same womb, same person, same, same genes produce a human being and a snake. How, do you understand how much uh, this manipulation reduces us to that level? I, I implore you that those of you who are young, I implore you, those of you who are educated or being educated, I implore you to have the moment of commemoration, but take a serious study. We, we commemorate, we remember to be inspired. See, the method applied in Rwanda were very, very different from the method applied in Congo. And by the way, you need to know, you need to know that this manipulation, the playing about the human brains, reducing the human brains into brains into less capacity of thinking, did not only work in Africa, it worked all over the world. People convincing other people that there are people who are less human and people who have more rights than the other. Therefore, manipulating and, and creating hardship for the Africans or for the black people, what they called, um, whatever you call it, it's they are less. Therefore, this took place all over the world. Professor Agnes said it rightly. The genocide did not only take place in Rwanda. It took place all over. You can imagine the agony of the people in Australia. The, the, the agony of the people, those who the remnant of the of the original of the of the of the original people in all of these countries where genocide took place. What you call Red Indians in America, in North America. I've gone to I, I visited New Mexico. They still meet you. They, they, they told me where I, uh, they asked me where I came from, and then they told me they were shedding tears. Say, you make us remember who we were and what we lost. They still cry. They still shed tears. So many years ago. Today, you have to remember. But to remember for inspiration, we need to make the future better. 
than what we suffered. We, we study for, in order to be able to engage, have the courage that Africa will be redeemed. Africa will be better because you commit to make it so. We can't just remember to raise our emotions and stop there. We can't, we, we can't remember to raise uh, uh, the agony of the roses and stop there. That's why I'll beg you, I'll ask you kindly, us together, to be able to support, comfort, and be grateful to the survivors of the genocide who may be among us. I will say, I will commit, I will say on your behalf, I will say on behalf of everybody who think like me that we need to tell the survivors of the genocide to be courageous, to continue to be noble, to continue to offer what they can afford to offer to make this nation what it must be. And they have done this very well. They have contributed to the well-being of this nation. But all of us, all of us, all of us are called to remember. And we should remember and keep remember and train our children and the generations after us to remember for more inspiration, for more commitment, for more work, hard work to make Rwanda, to make Africa, to make the world, to make the world a better world to live in. So that we can restore the noble relationships of nations. I was in Sudan recently and uh, I was uh, working with the, the leadership, ladies actually, that conference was uh, summoned by ladies in South Sudan. And they wanted to activate their talents so that they can contribute to the restoration of South Sudan. A country which is uh, actually being destroyed by their concept, tribal concepts, and they have never, they have, they have not, they have not put their hands together and their minds together and their brains together to make a nation called South Sudan. They still think they are tribes. And they fought, they fought a war for over 20 years. And some of them were in the refugee camps with us in Uganda. After fighting and after getting independence, then now they, they turned the barrels of their guns against each other just to defend tribes. And they are destroying a nation. I implore you. There are lots of things which can divide us not only Hutu, Twa, Tutsi, again, maybe, but even our personal interest. Can deter our commitment to the nation. I want to come back to RPA and the RPF. When RPA, RPF made the analysis of Rwanda and the pain in Rwanda and the loss in Rwanda, they did not only engage to stop the genocide, but they also intended, planned to stop the destruction of Rwandan community. From the hatred against the Tutsis, but there was also another phase two of the hatred, which started in 1973. When Abiy took over from Kaibanda, there was an, 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 a negative engaging of the, of the hatred and the fighting and the killings of the Southerners, namely the Gitarama area, Butare area, Nyanza area, those who th they thought were in support of Kaibanda, they, they became in trouble, second phase trouble, of the division of the nation. To the extent, to the extent that people could not move from the community to another commune without 
a fade route. They were almost, they possibly could have reached a point where one would be from one community to another, they would require a form of a passport to, to travel in your country. To the extent that even the, reg the reg re registration of their cars were bearing their districts. A car, a people get segregated to the extent that even the cars in the country get segregated. Not only segregating now the Tutsis from other, degrading the Tutsis, even education. Even some of the Hutus at that time were not getting the access to education. Because an ordinary person will not have their children educated because the, the, all, the schools were open for the, those who, the elite, the, the, those who call themselves elite. But you understand, when we talk about the, the genocide ideology, the, the worst disease that reduces the mind of the Rwandese to the level, to that level. Therefore, the RPF fought to stop the genocide, but also fought in the original vision of the, of the purpose of fighting the war was to restore the unity of the people of Rwanda. Stop vengeance. You can imagine the people who were fighting and they were jumping over the dead bodies of their relatives with the police of no revenge. But rather, those who were, who were surrendering to them, they were being trained and they would be brought into their ranks and fight alongside them. That's the uniqueness of Rwanda. I did history. I did, the, I did the African history. I did the European history. I did the American history in order to graduate in America. I, I, I tell you, you can't find this in the history of any of these countries who fighting people, capture them and train them, bring them into your ranks. You don't find it elsewhere. We read of, of their wars, and we do an analytical study of their wars, but they have not done it the way Rwanda did it. So we commemorate to be inspired. Those of you who are young, we are commemorating so that you take it over. You take this is it over. You learn from your, your, what the RPA, RPF, the government of Rwanda is doing. And they, soon after they captured the country, they called a meeting, said, come all of you, those of you who are killing us, come, let's have a meeting. Let's see how we are going to govern the country. And they came up with a government of national unity. You don't find this anywhere else. But it's for you to study, commemorate, learn from what has happened, see this new era. And I come to the role of the leadership. You can see what leaders did in the past. The person, the first person who confessed the word genocide in his mouth on a microphone like this was the president, Kaibanda. He's the one who mentioned the word genocide in his speech. And indeed, people learned from him. Therefore, you cannot, you cannot have a leader who is teaching people preaching genocide, and you fail to have the worst in the population. They trained the youth, they trained the communities, they trained, they trained this even in a, in a faith-based organization, the churches, and we came to what we came to because the leaders were propagating it. And therefore, when you have such leaders, they will not punish evil doing because they are the ones who are inspiring them to do evil. The role of leaders, as Professor Agnes put it rightly, all of us are leaders here. Even in the lecture room, students are leaders in their families where they come from. We are leaders, all of us are leaders. We need to continue to have this redemptive mission in Africa as we remember, as we commemorate, as we commit to make a difference and have a better Africa, have a better world, have a better Rwanda. I beseech you, you cannot afford to remember, commemorate for lesser purpose other than transformation.
And transformation is not just an emotional engagement. Remembering commemoration here, I want to employ you, I want to beseech you, I want to commit your will, if, you, if I may, so that you commemorate for inspiration, you commemorate for, for a purpose to make Rwanda better and not only make Rwanda better, make Africa better, be a messenger, be exemplary, be some an apparatus for trans, the transformation of, of Africa. I don't believe, I don't, I, I cannot believe, I can't take it that Africans or black people are, are, are less able to perform. No, we are all created in the image of God. This is my conviction. We are all the same, given the same opportunity, given the same exposure, Africans can do better. Therefore, we commemorate We commemorate for a purpose. And we shall continue to commemorate. A friend, a friend of mine and a friend of Rwanda, a friend called John, a member of parliament in his country, at one time he told me that uh, commemoration we help people continue to have the, 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 the sadness, raise their emotion, feel pain. Um, it will be detrimental to the survivors of the genocide. And to restore also be raising the guilty conscience of the Rwandese who did the genocide. Therefore, he was advising us that we should advise our leaders and the other people that we should stop commemorating. But it happened that I had gone in his country and I had seen the, the, the monuments of, the, of members of his communities who were killed during the, the German First World War. I'm avoiding to pray for me so that I may not mention that country. <laughs> I, I don't want to mention that country. But I, I mentioned his name because uh, we are many Johns. You can't know who that John is. <laughs> then he said, uh, please bury, bury the dead bodies. Do everything you can do. Finish it burying and forget, forget. But I said, John, Honorable John, I have come in your country. I've visited your place. And I've seen monuments. And every single year, you have a holiday to remember, to commemorate your people who were killed by, by, by the, during the German war. And your military, your commanders, your, 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 your generals, you have the, 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 the memorials in your country. Why do you want to commemorate your dead and you want our dead to be forgotten? We, know we were having coffee, and uh, his, his coffee grew. Eventually, he failed to take his coffee. And I encouraged him to take the coffee and continue to discuss, but it, literally, he failed to take the coffee. So I said, you see, if, 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 you can, if you can remember you are dead, why do you want us to remember the dead? You remember you are dead because you want to be inspired and fight for the security, fight for your being, fight your dignity. You don't want anybody to invade you and you don't want to be subjected to dehumanization as you did before. That's why you, you remember. And you want us to continue to be subjected to these less human levels of experience in life. The evening was long, a little, a little longer than uh, normal evenings. But we, have, we had to be realistic and open. But I'm happy that he has remained a friend of Rwanda. I'm happy that he has remained somebody who knows and cherishes the, 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 the vision and, and the commitment of Rwanda to be what you are today. 
if if it weren't if it weren't during the commemoration of our dead brothers and sisters dehumanized brothers and sisters I would have requested you to clap for our leadership but don't do it do it in your hearts Rwanda is what it is because of leadership if a president was propagating a genocide that was done by Kaibanda. It was implemented by Habyarimana. It was implemented by Sindikubwabo. It was implemented by Kambanda and many others in their campaigns holding a microphone like this one. But today, we have leaders who are saying, you need to be united. You need to work together to develop. We need to have an economy based on the well-being of the community. We need to develop or have education. I've been visit visiting your, ass your assimilator room, and uh, it's, uh, I asked your, one of your officers, and he said, this may be the, the first in Africa, if not the first in Africa, maybe the second, maybe the second. Rwanda is becoming the idea in Africa, not because Rwanda has changed, it's the same Rwanda, but what has changed is the leadership, is ideology, is execution, is commitment, is determination, is the resilience, is the commitment. Africa, Rwanda will be what it has to be because of you. I implore you, you can't afford to remember for the sake of remembering. And you have to sacrifice. President Kagame is uh, leading the country, but I'm sure and you know he still mourns his dear friend, Fred Rugema, who consecrated his life for what we are today. And many others. Each one of us, Rwanda is here. We know one person, two, three, four, who died in the war trying to liberate our dignity trying to stop the genocide, trying to make Rwanda better. I can tell you, I can tell you, I know so and so, I know so and so, I know my nephew so and so, I know so and so, I know, we know they have sacrificed so that we can be what we are today. You need to sacrifice, sacrifice something so that the generations after us may be better than we can conceive. It has to be better. Africa has to be better. This is a global college. It's not, it's not only medicine. It's not only human rights. It's not only justice. But it's the wholeness of life. That we need to study, have the wisdom, have the commitment to make our world a better place to be. The government of Rwanda therefore committed to do a lot of things, put up systems, put up institutions to fight against the genocide, institutions to promote unity and reconciliation, put up institutions to grow the economy, put up institutions to have better governance from the genocide, by the way. And you understand, we still have two emotions we still cry and mourn our beloved ones. You realize that to this day, we have not even been able to bury everybody who was murdered, was killed, humiliated, dismembered, and thrown into, into unworthy places. We haven't been able to bury all of them. We don't even know where they are today. Yes, we still have a journey. We still have the emotions. Yes, we, we still have a journey to make the economy which was destroyed. Yes, we have a journey to build our unity. Yes, we have a journey, but we have to make it. And it, we shall make it through commitment. And I want to tell you, we have to have the humility we have to have the humility to learn from others. We can't go this journey alone. 
But again, we need to be so careful, extremely careful, that nobody derails us from truck. Good leadership has put us on truck for 28 years. We are remembering, but we are also celebrating the difference they have made in our lives. They have established our hope. We know it can be done. We can't afford to be derailed. I implore you, be wise. Be wise and be truthful. Sometimes we need to be able to speak the truth. Sometimes with humility, but I speak the truth. You can't go alone, but at the same time, you can't let somebody derail you because of offers. If, if, if Mobutu, Sese Seko was Obango Kokongwendu raised from the dead. And he considers, considers the offers he was given to betray his brother, his boss, Lumumba, and had Lumumba killed, tied, and killed, dismembered, and thrown into acid. <coughs> I tell you, if, if Mobutu came alive and he saw the background of his mess, he would cry a flow of tears and he would regret. And I think that's why he said, Après moi, there is. Après moi, after me, chaos. Because he know the chaos started in his conviction, in his heart, in his failure, in his betrayal, and he made his country chaotic. And I wish, but it can't happen. That's what the human beings are. But if he came back to life, he will, he will regret the messes he has created. We cannot afford to continue to betray Africa. We cannot afford to continue to betray our own. We have still to engage the following. One, today we are being united. We are, we are now preaching, we are teaching, we are bringing people to realize that we are Rwandis, Ndumunya Rwanda. I'm, I'm Rwandis, I'm who I am. Ndumunya Rwanda comes before everything. The dignity of being who I am comes before everything. Comes before everything I can own. M nothing compares to me. Not my wealth, not my positions, not, not, not my, 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 my papers from the school, not anything, not, not even my experience. Who I am is who I am is me, and that comes first. It's my priority. Dubunya Rwanda therefore comes first. But we are being taught to know something else is better than who you are. Your rights are second to somebody's rights. And nobody will give you rights as a gift. Your rights will be fought for and you arrive, your rights will be sustained. So we still have a commitment to make. But we still have problems to solve. We are still struggling with the emotions and the hurt of the genocide, the repercussions of the genocide. Take again the opportunity, I can't be exhausted, take the opportunity to, to comfort the survivors of the genocide. But I want you to know, I want you to take, to understand the level I conceive of the burden of the guilt of conscience among the Rwandan people. You are realizing that these people who died, a million people in a hundred days, were killed over these hills of Rwanda. People were chasing them during the daylight. Somebody knows somebody who killed somebody. And not everybody 
who showed, who pointed fingers, and even those, some of them who killed, have not, not been taken to prison. They are still at large in this community if they are not yet dead. But those who are still living here with me and with you are cutting the guilty conscience. And you cannot be healthy when you are being haunted by the guilt. And we have to heal this society. And that's, we need to protect this society from the inherent guilt conscience. The children and the family members of the perpetrators of the genocide who carry the guilt of the crimes of their relatives. We need to prevent that. Rwanda has a job to do. And you have a job to do. And it's our responsibility, common responsibility. Professor Agnes said that we are all leaders. We need to be all open and a sacrifice to heal this society. Two, we have the Rwandese at large all over the world, in Africa and in many other countries on other continents who committed the genocide and who stole the property and the money of this country and are using that in the propaganda to sabotage and to say evil things about this nation. And by the way, some of the people who supported, who created these policies that led us to destruction are supporting them because they don't want us to expose what they did to us and not only to us, but elsewhere. Somebody mentions Ukraine. Ukraine is not suffering the consequences of Ukraine. Ukraine must be fighting in something beyond them. They must be suffering not because they are meant to suffer. They are suffering because of something that is meant and possibly done beyond they are doing beyond, but they, they are the victims that the battlefield of a bigger situation. You are the dot-com people going to research. So we still have a problem to handle. Three. We still have people in our community who are not yet convinced it's their role to make a difference. I will therefore finish by requesting you to carry an assignment Professor Agnes kindly helped me with, which was actually my conclusion, to take up responsibility and be leaders. Apply your, edu your education, not only for your self-aggrandizement, but for the redemption and transformation of Rwanda, Africa, and the world. This global entity here in Rwanda should become a source of transformation in this global life. I thank you. Is there anybody? If the mass of ceremonies allows us, is there any questions that are coming or discussion? Okay. Do you want me to go back? Okay. Thank you very much, Bishop. Uh, this time, we want to uh, welcome questions. Um, I was
Jesus is saying, thank you very much, Bishop, for this great talk. Please tell me to welcome questions. And because of time, I'd like people who have questions to ask them briefly and hit on point. Thank you. Contribution are also welcome. Con contribution are also welcome. I have a question behind the sign. So first, I uh, receive this question, then we we'll come to you. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Uh, I go straight to my question. Uh, despite uh, what the country has done, done, we still see some of the youth still see themselves in uh, in division. So I have two questions. My first question is: um, As young men, young women here, how do we handle that? How do we educate our fellow young people who see see themselves at, as Hutu, Tkwa, or Tutsi? But also, um, uh, I'm a little bit of a pessimist and an optimist. I believe in the best, fight for the best, hope for the best, but still prepare for the worst. In case there are some people who uh, won't, who are still uh, resistant to change, what, how do we prepare for that as future leaders in health, in education, in, in governments? How do we prepare for that? Thank you. Uh, I, I wish I wish you told us your name. Apologies, my name is Octave Guagasana, EJC staff. Pardon, Gasana? Octave Guagasana. Guagasana. Uh, Guagasana has uh, two problems. One, there are some youths who still call themselves Hutu and others who call themselves Tutsi. And uh, he, how, how can you help them? How can you educate them? Two, there are some people who are resistant to change. How do you handle that? These two questions, there are, there are some people. By the way, we, we did a research on uh, some of the genealogies and some of the people, uh, some of our people. Uh, I will give you, uh, we did a, a genealogical research, which you can prove scientifically, if those of you who are doing uh, researches. And uh, we got some Batuti Bakono, who, uh, who are descendants of uh, Bijirimana, who came from the south. And we got Abajiri, who come also from Obijirimana. Some of them are Hutu, and some of them are Tutsis. In a genocide, they killed, each other. They killed their, their brothers. And we, we, we followed up those genealogies, and they all agreed they are descendants of Obijirimana. So you can teach them by scientific facts. You can teach them from the historical realities of Rwanda. You can teach them from many other aspects. And we did that among Abasinga. We found some of them who are Abatuti, Abahutu, Nabatwa, who come from the same descendant. But they are now in those three classes, and they were in the, in the genocide. Some of them suffered at the hands of their brothers. So you need to have the patience to know that those resistant, by the way, we still have parents who are realistically poisoning their children at home by telling them different from what the, the, the government of Rwanda, what the people, the realities and the truth, and we, they teach them about those hate attitudes at home. So you have to be patient and they continue to engage them. Two. Those who are resistant to change, time will change them. But, but you need to do something, Rwagasana. You need to keep your resilience and don't give up on them. 
I like the statement President Kagame said some years ago. Maybe Professor Agnes can remind me of the year. But he said, no Munyarwanda should be thrown into, let Munyarwanda be thrown away. Engage, work on them, keep, keep working on them, keep teaching them, keep loving them, keep working. Don't, don't, don't let go of any Munyarwanda. So my friend Wagasana, I wish you could have more time after this, then we talk. But you can't give up on your brothers and sisters. I, I know there are those who think they are Bahutu, and one of them actually was an engineer, and he came from uh, one of those uh, people, the Bakono. He was a Mujiri uh, until uh, his, great grand, his grandmother convinced him and told him the historical realities and truth today. He's now cooperating with, the, with his uh, fellow Abakono uh, from Abigirimana, and he's one of them. He, he gave up on it. But you can't surrender working on your brothers. You have to redeem them first before you go elsewhere. Thank you. Another one? Can I, can I add? Sorry. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> I, want that, uh, I want to say that uh, you are a dot com, huh? Uh, Bishop have tell us a portion of our history. We were social classes. If you go to any dictionary, you take it in French, in English, that's why I speak a little. What is the definition of a tribe? It's a group of people that speak the same language practice the same religion and the same culture. No other definition. You will not find it. What were we? We have one language that I speak so badly. <laughs> we had one culture that our parents, that is changing, evolving. And in Rwanda, they were Rwandans. So if your friends agree that they are Rwandans, that's a good start. The rest is to show them dot com history. Look at another country that I know well as well, France. 17, uh, in the 17th cycle, they had the feudals, what were the Stutzis. They were the people, and they had, so that was the two. We had another one who had a special status here, the Toi. Now, remember the culture. If a Hutu were behaving well, the king can make him a Tutsi. There was a word for that, isn't it? <laughs> they call in our language, uh, which uh, Agnes may. They call Kwihutura. When, when, a, when a, a person from the class, the Hutu class, was promoted into the Tutsi class, they used to call that ceremony Kwihutura. And in other feudal countries, UK, even the Queen is still doing it now. Okay? So being from the feudal class, the people class, doesn't make you part of a tribe. So just dot com history. And don't let people put in our head. It's like the John who try to, to tell the other John your death are less have less value than ours. Our tribe has no less value. We didn't have them. Our nation has no less value than the France of the UK, etc dot com history. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Was there another there was another person? Hi, my name is Jennifer Dixon and I'm in the MBBS class of twenty twenty eight. Um, first of all thank you for sharing your discussion with us today, Bishop and Professor Agnes. So my question is related to the religious aspect. I wanted to add, 
Come closer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll stay here then. I wanted to ask, so at the time you were a man of clergy during the 100 days, and I wanted to ask, how was it going through that, and was your faith shaken at any time? And second of all, as you said, um, after the after the 100 days, um, a lot of people came to Christianity, and I believe the country is predominantly Catholic. So I wanted to ask, how did the church encourage people to go and be a part of the Christian community? and also be Christian. Thank you. It's okay, you can stay. Jennifer, Jennifer has a, a good question. But she says, during the genocide, was faith, Christianity, shaken? Huh? My <laughs> certainly was shaken. Let me tell you, Jennifer. Uh, in ninety four, in May, in May ninety four, I was uh, in the United States of America preaching. I used to go to the states once a year and spend. A preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in all denominations in America. And in April 94, I was on a preaching tour with, accompanied by my wife, Harriet, and uh, we, we, we were following every, every evening the horrors and the killings in Rwanda, and we saw the dead bodies Dead bodies on Lake Victoria. The following day, we saw that on CNN. The following day, I called our team, our preaching team, and uh, I requested them to allow me to stop the preaching tour and fly back to Uganda, then organize the team to come to Rwanda. Yes, I was shaken to the core. Because I knew this country, Rwanda, run away from in 1959 because I, I, I ran for my life, for my security with my parents. Predominantly Christian, not necessarily Catholic, but Christian. Of course, in numbers, Catholics are more. But I, I, I felt a sense of loss of purpose for these religious organizations. If religious organizations had been committed the way these young men and women in Motanyi, the Arab had been committed to that extent, Not Christian. Faith. Are you telling me today? Are they doing the work of reconciliation? Are they doing it? Yes, they are. Like, like they, they messed up, like, uh, like the police of that time messed up, like the minister of that time messed up, like anybody in Rwanda messed up. Everybody in the Um, I come from a country uh, which for the past seven years is facing a leadership 
which blatantly discriminates against the minorities. Uh, its, its leaders openly, every day, when I, go, uh, when I read newspapers while I'm here, every day there is news and reports of its leaders blatantly announcing various heinous crimes against, the mi against one particular minority community. Uh, it, and it's, it is going the same way, the same path, which Rwanda was in in the early 90s. I am fearful for my country. Civil society tries to organize itself, but the government machinery is so strong, so powerful, that it has quietened the media, it has brought over the media, it has quietened the judiciary, it has brought over the police and the investigative authorities, and civil society is not able to do much. What do you suggest that young people or people who look, who look at this with horror, what do we do? What do you suggest? Dear Rachel, I... Did you, did you get uh, Rachel's question? I'm sure you did, you, under, you understood her accent. You, you live with her, so you saw you understand the Indian ex, uh, accent. Rachel, I want to tell you that uh, I've been in India and I've been reading and I've read about India, the discrimination of the of the of some of the your people. And uh, I think you are right to say that the, the government machinery is so powerful. And uh, the civil society is uh, neutralized. Um, newspapers uh, are under fear. They don't operate properly. But uh, I want to encourage you, Rachel, don't lose hope. You may be the source of the transformation of India. There is nothing powerful than the will and the agony and the pain and, and the desire to make a difference based on the truth, based on, based on the true human experience. There is nothing you can imagine can be as powerful as the will of the people. Keep your faith high. Rachel, have you been able to see Mount Mohabura? Not yet. Maybe you have seen it, but you don't know it. President Kagame was in the, that mountain in a, in, a, in, a type of, uh, in a type of wood they call it Migano. It, very cold. Some of the young men died there because of the cold weather. He didn't have more than, he didn't have even a thousand young men with him in the mountains. But I want to tell you, he overthrew a very powerful government supported by France, supported by Congo, supported by Angola, supported by Egypt. They, they had all the equipment, but they didn't have the truth of what they were doing. And President Kagame, and the, then the, the rebel leader, they called him at that time, and the young men and the women with him, poor fed, fed from, from, from dried maize, corn, and the, in there, but they have a very powerful will, they have a commitment, they have the agony, they have the pain of seeing the loss of human beings, they are having the pain to redeem the human dignity, they, they overthrew a powerful collusion, collusion of governments, and uh, here we are today. India will be redeemed if you commit to make it so. Revolutions in the world have not started by many people and have no, never been started by governments. But if you fight for the right cause, if you, you, if you express that agony in the planning and the strategy and action, you will make it. But if you only agonize and uh, talk about it and um, write in newspapers and do nothing, then it will take longer. So have faith. 
it will be done. And I've been there, I've seen it. I've seen people, families living, living into under bridges. I know, I know what you say. I've seen it physically with my eyes. So what we are talking about is sad, but somebody has to redeem it. And it cannot be, it cannot be redeemed by the British. It cannot be redeemed by the French. It cannot be redeemed by the superpowers. It will be redeemed by Indians. I'm happy that you are young. Keep working on it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Zisavira, and I also have one question to ask. Um, so, as young people who were born after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, most of us are very interested into learning about the history and also researching different information to know what really happened in the country. And we are really grateful and honored to be, have been able to run more today. I personally run a lot. Uh, so sometimes we do meet uh, people from other countries who are also interested into learning the history of Rwanda. They do ask you questions, you do try to answer them. But they also sometimes for me, people ask me, where can I get the right information about Rwanda? Is there a website? Is there a YouTube channel? But given that you do Google things and find also some of the people with the genocide ideologies, people who are denying, there is a lot of things on the internet. Uh, so, Bishop, is there any website, any resource, any person, anything you would recommend us to even uh, for us as young people to um, to educate ourselves, but also to recommend other people who are interested into learning the truth that happened in Rwanda? Thank you. She has a very very good name, but 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 it's so cozy. This I think uh, your your question is is true uh, is is a very good one and true. Uh, we we have a, a book written on the history of Rwanda. Um, maybe given a chance. You, I can let you borrow that book. It is produced uh, by some historians from the University of Rwanda with the, in, a, in a collaboration with the, the former, uh, what we used to call the Unit and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I, I don't know which language do you prefer, English or French. I can let you borrow that book if you promise to return it. Uh, but uh, there are also some uh, other sources I can give to your leaders to be able to, for you and for anybody to exploit and do research from them. But I, I will promise to let you have that book and uh, read. If you want English or you want French, whichever is your preference, I can let you borrow that book. But uh, the history of Rwanda need to be sorted out. There are some people who have written about the history of Rwanda using the the foreigners, this foreigners approach to writing. Because some people did write, use the facts, but explain them their own way. Explain the facts, use the facts for their purpose. You need to be careful when you, when you study history, you need to be very analytical. That's what we do when we are studying history. Why did things happen and by what time, by who? and uh, what purpose. So you need to be able to be able to receive from the inf information you, you get from different sources. But uh, m some of the books are written using the information, foreign information, others are written honestly to share facts and history, its chronology in order to educate the youth of this nation. But uh, the history is still in the making. Thank you so much. Uh, what I can say, it's a great question. Anthony, where are you? <coughs> Tony, Anthony, the librarian. <coughs> he 
is on leave. <clears throat> so let's connect with us. We should have those books available. Okay? So uh, I, I, we, we have the, the dot com, <laughs> but uh, we will get the, the reference and we will get those books here. And also, it has to be part of our history, you know? And we have to, to know that our history has not been, except now, written by us. You remember the, the story of the lion and the hunter? If the lion doesn't know how to write, the hunter will always write the story. So it's time for us as um, a bishop is saying, to continue to dig and to do it. And, and that's good also that the government of Rwanda has elevated the National Commission um, in charge of the genocide and the murder at the level of a ministry. Mm? So this is also a place you could go. But we are going to bring those books here. And uh, be very, very critical and analytical. Even what is written about Africa today, be very critical and analytical. Yes, please. Uh, so, I guess uh, Jocelyn is a student of ours. Uh, there is one definitive actually source, and it's a website, Kwibuka RW. You might not find everything on that website, but you will find resources that will bring you deeper into the topic. And there's one thing I want to suggest since you asked the question, do start a club. I mean, this is a, a, a university, it's not a kindergarten. What people do here is to think and write. In your field, there should be someone who is interested in starting a, a book club, um, and especially this time of Kwebuka, invite people, invite me, invite leaders, invite the bishop, Engage in your, for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the, of the university. I think it's a great question that you did ask, but Kwibuka RW exists, and uh, Kwibuka also has now a larger digital platform. It is called Kwibuka Digital, and there are probably people who are younger than you, who contribute, who ask questions. I did started my, I started my own journey into uh, learning history when I was 15. So I don't think you're too old. Actually, you are very equipped. You have a laptop. You have internet. Um, you did ask a good question. So you have quilka.rw. We indeed have now a ministry uh, that with, with which we can interact. But please start a book club. Don't even wait for the librarian. Just do it. You, you have all the resources you need. And you can, from that platform, ask so many people to intervene and engage with you guys online, on Zoom, and why not here on site? Thank you. Yes, young lady. Hello. Um, well, my name is Divine Usabase. Um, I'm a Rwandan who... Uh, I was born in Burundi, and uh, I'm slightly nervous asking this question or making even the comment, but I read somewhere that courage is being afraid of doing something and doing it anyway, so <laughs> I'm <laughs> borrowing a little bit of courage as I do so. So uh, growing up, I was born in 1995, and I grew up hearing that in Burundi there was also a genocide in 1993. And um, so somehow I heard stories similar to what I'm hearing in Rwanda. I didn't grow up here. I grew up a little bit you know, in Burundi and elsewhere. But of course, I have read about the history of Rwanda, of my people. My parents have told me about that. And I have heard similar things occurred in Burundi as well in 1993. However, there are so many people that do not know about it. There are many of my Rwandan friends that when I even bring this topic, they're like, what? I never heard about that in Burundi. And um, as the bishop was telling us the history, I think I know perhaps why that's the case. Um, he said that what really made a difference in Rwanda is the leadership. 
ensuring that people use the right terminology for what happened. Um, and I'm always really, you know, as right now, I'm, I just turned 27, and in Burundi, it's about it's been 29 years, and the, to my knowledge, there has been no effort for any sorts of reconciliation, of even having open dialogue about what did happen in 1993. Um, and I recall that one of the things you mentioned, Bishop, is that um, Pan-Africanism is something that as Rwandans, we need to continue working towards, not only for peace and security within the country, but also to our neighbors to you know, teach them what we have learned and how it can be practiced. So I think, I don't know how I can formulate this question, but how can we as Rwandans help Burundi get to the level that Rwanda has gotten to, where we can openly sit here and discuss and ask questions and look towards the future, because I feel there's a lot of secrecy around what did happen in Burundi. And like Rachel said, I'm also concerned about my country. Burundi is also my country as much as Rwanda is my country. And I'm concerned about what could happen by consistently ignoring what did happen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Devine. I think uh, how can Rwanda help Burundi uh, to have the courage? I think to, to have the courage of uh, saying the truth about uh, what happened and uh, possibly redeem the emotions of the Burundi people. Uh, the genocide which took place in 73 in Burundi um, in um, areas uh, of Matana, and um, uh, I've been there, I've been in Burundi. And uh, I've, uh, I've been discussing that with some of the people, actually some of the remnants, some of the members, some of the remnants of the families which were killed then, at that time. But Rwanda cannot dictate on Burundi. The truth is that the Hutu Tutsi hatred in Burundi contagiously affected Burundi, and the Burundi also tried to engage the same hatred. By the way, Burundi was governed by the same um, infectious uh, divide and rule system, so Burundi was not, uh, was not less infected by the divisionism and by the sense of divide and rule by dividing them uh, so the Hutu Tutsi issue, which really you, we want you to be able to not only to research, but to have a proper scientific and uh, historical diagnosis, and uh, you cannot have tribes in Burundi and have Hutu be tribes and have Tutsi be a tribe in Burundi, but to our shame, they also killed each other, they killed their brothers. They, they, in, in Burundi, I have seen them in Matana, I've been there, I went there. I'm telling you from history, from experience, I went there, I saw that. But how can Rwanda help Burundi and the Burundi government and the Burundi leadership and the Burundi people to be able to have the courage to share and expose their embarrassment and the evil acts and the actions which took place in their society in order to heal it, in order to put, to, put, to put up a process that would lead to an end of it. That's why Gwagasana was telling us there are some young men and women who are deadly convinced they are, tribe, they are tribal Hutus and they are tribal Tutsis. They don't see these as those classes of the time, they don't see the importance of Rumanya Rwanda today. So it's a process. Rwanda can help Burundi by demonstrating, by being a witness of the results of our unity in life. Burundi will learn, they cannot fail to learn from us. And it's not only Burundi which is covering that reality and the truth. There are areas, you go, you go, to, go to Turkey, Have you, have you heard about Turkey? Go and research about Turkey, the genocide in Turkey. 
I went to meet refugees in Israel from Turkey who still live in Israel, who are at large in the world today. And they, and they ran away from Turkey and they were have, suffering from the genocide there. But Turkey has never taken a step to accept there was a genocide there. Go to these superpowers. They committed genocides all over. But they have never taken a step to say yes. I have a friend from the United States. We went to school together. And he came and told me, Bishop John, I want to help you with your efforts of reconciliation. And I started reconciliation at Sunrise School. I had survivors of the genocide. I had orphans from other backgrounds. And I, I loved them together. And they grew up together. Even today, they love each other. They said, I want to help you. We can find you fundraise the money to do even more. But we disagreed on one fact. He told me that we want to have a system and, uh, and, and teaching apparatus and means to teach people how to manage conflict. Then I said, my brother, I love you, but I don't want to manage conflict. I want to have a resolution to the conflict. I want to put an end to the conflict. I groan in my heart. I cry with my, my, my real tears that Rwanda should have an end to this conflict. And that's not what we want to teach in Rwanda. We disagreed on, 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 that, on that reality. Burundi has not let go of it because they still do it. So what we can do, what we can help is to be able to, op to be open to Burundi, our brothers in Burundi. We need to be able to tell them. We need to counsel with them. Rwanda is, is witnessing to the world. Rwanda is, is, is helping, is going to Darfur. By the way, you remember Rwanda went to Darfur first. When there was a genocide going on in Darfur, Rwanda in pain, in its economic survival, in, in, in everything, but because of conv conviction, they put the soldiers, Rwanda soldiers and the police on the plane and went to Darfur to stop the genocide. With a feeble economy, but with strong conviction. Superpowers found Rwanda in Darfur. And you've heard where Rwanda is today and what Rwanda is doing. Rwanda is setting an example, but it cannot dictate on a, in another state. Because Rwanda, by helping, is one of the things that will help is to respect the integrity of other states, but demonstrate in life, in action, in sharing, so that they can also change. That's what I think I my nation and my, our people can be able to offer. But Rwanda cannot dictate on Burundi. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bishop. Uh, for the sake of time, we have um, one question online. And this question goes to Honorable Mayor. Khaisa uh, Mavunyi asked, um, as a, someone working closely with the community, what changes has, has, have you witnessed in the last 28 years due to the leadership of unity and reconciliation? To the mayor. For the mayor, I'm glad that you got to me. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. I think that uh, everyone can see the changes. Okay. As a result of uh, good leadership, discrimination has stopped already. We are all equal as Rwandans. I can benefit all the benefits of the country, regardless I am tall or short. I can, uh, maybe this is enough. Mm. We have good leadership and we are uh, access to all, maybe political or social, economic uh, benefits from the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mayor. Can we add something? Sure. 
add something by somebody who didn't grow up here, who just learned at the age of 18 that they were Tutsi Hutu, because my parents uh, were so disgusted by this country that they even taught us Kinyarwanda and the story and anything. But when I came in 96, and where I am today, the difference is, in 96, I will never let my bottle open here and go to the restroom and come back and continue to drink it because I was afraid to be poisoned. I have a daughter in this room and I make her life miserable because I refuse her to sleep over in families where I know there was a killer. In a family where I know, and all families, Head. So they revolt one day and they say, we are fed up, we go. So that means change. We don't, we, we, our, our identity card change. We don't ask those former social class, we go on merit. You are Rwandan. So, so many things has changed that uh, we came in a divided country, and today we are in a country where unity is at the front front of everything we do. That's a testimony about what I saw in communities, and it's so huge that uh, when I was working in South Africa, people, a Tutsi family, didn't want to be treated by a Hutu nurse, and vice versa because of the uh, being afraid of the revenge. Isn't it, Bishop? Yes. Today is not the case, I don't care. I'm in pain, I go to the one who can treat me. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think uh, that question can uh, take, uh, uh, thank you for being conscious of time and, and especially to redeem us who go far. Uh, <laughs> I think really the master of ceremony is very kind to me <laughs> because he's, he's, tr he's trying to redeem the time. You know, Musanzi is a, the road is not, uh, I don't want to ask that question to the mayor, <laughs> but the road is not all that perfect. <laughs> so he's, he's thinking that uh, we, we really need to have time to go back, but that question is very important. The, the question, the, is it Mufuni? Yeah, the difference in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a society today. You know, a, a, a society which did not only have the right to have their children educated, a society which did not have right to travel from one community to another, a society which was so scared to death to meet or even dare come along the road where a, a political leader is, but find a shortcut and, and run away. Today, people are courageous enough even to speak up and challenge the wrongdoing that takes place anywhere in the society, and be even to challenge the leaders if they go corrupt, if they do in some kind of injustice, they, be, they are able now to be able to speak up and challenge it. You did not have that before. The, the citizens are now meeting with the army, with the uh, army, with the, with the police, with uh, any other institutions of the government and be able to propose what they think could be right for them. And we did not have this before. The people of Rwanda are, 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 are becoming redeemed from inside out. And the, the best of all, they are living together peacefully. We can't only talk about security. We cannot only talk about education. We cannot talk about social engagements. But there are many, so lots of changes. Please explain to Mavuini, if she's not hearing us, your dot com be able to give her the, 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 the reality of the change in our society. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop, and the entire panel for such a great uh, discussion and for allowing us to extend time 
uh, regardless of how far you'll be heading back to home. Uh, as we'll be coming to the uh, end of our uh, ceremony, I'd like to call upon uh, Honorable Mayor to give us the closing remarks. Thank you. Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, your worship bishop, uh, UGH staff, uh, readers and the students, distinguished guests, good afternoon. Uh, I would take this opportunity to thank UGH for organizing this memorial event to commemorate the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. I also thank Bishop for the exchange about the history of Rwanda, mainly the genocide against the Tutsi. This is the time to reflect on the past, to remember the tragedy our country went through, whereby more than one million of the Tutsi lost their lives uh, due to the way they have been created by God. This serves as the reason to know where we come from, and they, to know where we are leading our country to create the brighter future. This is a good moment to thank RPF and Hotani for their sacrifice to save the life of the Tutsi who were being hunted day and night to be exterminated. I thank in particular the President of the Republic of Rwanda, His Excellency Paul Kagame, who led the battle to liberate the country from the hands of the bad regime and stop the genocide against the Tutsi. Even though we have that bad history, as we have recently all, today, as a Rwandan, we are lucky. We are under the leadership of an exceptional leadership, His Excellency Paul Kagame, which, uh, whose leadership is promoting unity and reconciliation by building uh, a real identity of all Rwandans. I would call uh, all upon, including UJG community, to be part of the fight against the genocide ideology and the all related crimes by sharing the real history of Rwanda, the truth of Rwandans, by using different platforms such as social media, doing so many research and information dissemination so that the truth of Rwandan history can be understood everywhere. Let's all of us stand against genocide ideology and commit to say genocide never again. I thank you for your kind attention by remaining, uh, reminding you to remember, unite, and renew. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Your Honorable Mayor. Uh, this is now we're coming to the end of uh, today's event. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, participation. I also want to request those who are heading to Kigali, please to uh, rush now because of time so the buses can start heading back to Kigali. Thank you very much. Dot com and research continue.